three, two, one. Hey everyone, Jonathan. This is Dev Talk number two. You know, it's been a while, but uh, we, fact, we figured this is gonna be a good product to do it on. We're gonna be doing our Dev Talk on the C8 under tray splitter that we just came out with a few weeks ago. And uh, today it's gonna be obviously myself and Joseph here, and we're inside our high tech studio filming. And uh, so let's get right into it. This is a product I think I was really most excited about. Um, usually when we talk about under trays, I think it's really a cool product. I think it kind of separates a bit of the clientele, but the way we did the C8 I found was we were able to sort of mesh both the best of both worlds with protection and performance. Whereas I think some of our earlier under trays we had came up with were mainly just for performance. So I think I'm gonna start there. When did we sort of start making our first under trays? I know if we go back to the Camaro line, the Gen 5, our T4 splitter had the option to add the under tray. So can you talk a bit more about the 33-4-115? Yeah, that goes back all the way to uh, 2010, actually. So um, that was one of our first splitters. And uh, originally when we were making splitters, they were intended to always have an under tray. So uh, we were really trying to optimize performance at that point. So um, under trays were always in the design work. The only flaw or the con at that point was costing. So we started removing under trays from our product line. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were offering uh, splitters without the under tray, which in reality, there's nothing wrong. It's still generating downforce, just not as much. And it's not as strong. So I'd say it's probably the biggest con. Yeah. But a lot of um, the OEM splitters don't have under trays either. So it's not always the case where every customer is trying to max out the aero sides of it. It's always about a balance, and uh, that's the great thing. We're now offering the option of both. Yeah. The T4 Spur is, is still kind of cool because it, it does still sell uh, quite well, I'd say, for given the you know the time frame of that uh, that car and what have you. That was probably our first under tray, I think, uh, I think mm -hmm. that's correct, right? And then um, go fast forward maybe four years, 2014, 2015, we introduced some other sort of under, under trays, namely our uh, 45403. That had sort the of like C7. An, yeah, the C7 line with Corvettes. That had like an integrated under tray into it. Like that was a was, splitter built with an under tray, essentially. With a belly pad, we were trying again to make it easy to install and protect the car. We weren't really going for uh, the ultimate aero benefits, but we were trying to get a medium between the two where we were covering up the whole car, increasing the strength of the splitter. We weren't getting the full blown downforce because it wasn't really flush with the tip, but we still found the balance. So we had a good solution and the price point was really right. Yeah. That's, I mean, today still, that's a great splitter for us. A lot of guys <laughs> still like it. It's got a really aggressive look onto it. And then the fact that it's got that belly pan that you're seeing is- Drivability. Cool. Yeah. And uh, when you drive it, uh, you're not changing the right height of the car. So you're not gonna be scraping and, and breaking these. Yeah. And then we have obviously our, probably our most famous C7 splitter, which is the Z06 style one, the 45-4036-7. And then I made another sort of splitter um, for an under tray on that product, but that was sort of a new splitter entirely, right? Like, wasn't something that we could take a under tray and add it to a 037? You have to choose when you were purchasing the splitter. So really, you have to make the decision on the get-go. Uh, at that point, the customer doesn't really know um, what he's going to do with the car, right? So if he just purchased a car, he has to make a decision, under tray or not. And there was no turning back. You couldn't add it after the fact. Mm -hmm. And a lot of customers regretted not buying it and were really disappointed when they had to buy a whole new splitter when they started doing track events. Yeah. Where did like the, the idea to make an undertray for that splitter come from? Was that just something you always sort of- You mean the 059? To? Yeah. From the get-go. I mean, again, uh, our first splitters always had an undertray and our mindset was always to make the best possible product from the get-go. So we're actually deleting undertrays on our product line and we were just doing that for simplicity and really what customers wanted. Most of the people are upgrading the aero package without, um, well, they're upgrading it really for, for the cosmetic upgrade and some of the benefits. So again, it's not the fact that you don't have an under trade that the splitter doesn't work. It's just not as aggressive or as, uh, as efficient. And, and again, not everybody's doing workers in the back and it's all about balance. So for um, the guy that's doing, uh, the guy that has a daily driver, a non under tray splitter is perfectly fine. So it's really not for everybody. Yeah. Until you start considering the protection. So if you're worried about scrapes, then yes, the under tray is a winner. Yeah. 
And what were those, um, what are those under trays made out of? And those splitters, the, the ones we've talked about, the T4, the uh, 059, those like what material were we using? Uh, using? We were using RTM, resin transfer molding. In principle, it's a composite plastic or fiberglass. Um, back then, we were going crazy a little bit with the design and we really wanted it all integrated. So we were limited to the process we, we could have done. Um, mm -hmm. Back then, the only way to do it was a two-piece design and bonded together. And they, injection wasn't even a possibility because of the way we were designing things and a little bit the parameters we're setting. So we've loosened up a little bit of that and added more variables and, and components. Mm -hmm. So today, we have a whole new concept of how we assemble these. Right. And so, I mean, perfect segue into the C8 now, the C8 splitters and pretty much our entire C8 product line is now transitioned to this new material we're using. Um, Maybe just talk about now about uh, that new material. What are we sure. using and what exactly is it? How did it come about? Well, it all started probably uh, right when the C7 was being introduced. We were trying to develop a new plastic. So we worked with our resin suppliers and uh, we tested a whole bunch of different materials. And uh, the biggest criteria was really the fact that a splitter with or without an under tray could take the high speed the car could take. So, so we know that these cars could hit 200 miles an hour. So we said, you know what, let's make that our benchmark. If you can't drive this part at any speed the car could go to, then that material is not for us. Right. And that eliminated uh, all the ABS and uh, all the, the thin fiberglass and, and even some of the designs in carbon fiber were still not meeting that criteria. So basically, we designed a splitter to work without an under tray. So it makes me think a lot of how GM designed their car to be a convertible and then they make it a hard top. Well, that's a little bit our idea. Let's design a splitter that you could drive without an under tray. And if you add the under tray, we're not mechanically making it stronger, but we're also adding the geometry aspect. And that's really what we're doing. But the geometry has to withstand all the scrapes and surprises you may hit on the road or the track. Driving over a cone, a little curb rash, hitting uh, an obstacle uh, and obviously going up inclines so, so those were all things that were added on but from the get-go the standard splitter is perfectly fine mm -hmm. the under tray is really for somebody that wants to go over the top performance and protection so we have our 1vm we have our 5vm or 7vm and also um, gm's 5vm carbon fiber that our under tray can fit on um, how did how do you approach sort of making an under tray that's going to be able to fit on all these products? And also, um, what's sort of like your, your design process to make it work? Well, pretty simple. When we came out with uh, our version of 5EM splitter, we did use the GM concept. So, so the, the whole perimeter of that splitter is identical. And geometrically speaking, they're pretty much uh, identical. That's why the, the parts are interchangeable. We designed a bucket that would work with both setups. So when you look at our bucket itself, you, you'll notice there's different features on it. It's a multi-piece design. So it lets you adjust it. And uh, we're using all the OEM mounting points and the geometry itself lets us use both. Uh, we're fortunate our part was nominal because we're injecting it. It's smooth on both sides. The only thing you have to worry about in the carbon is that it, it's irregular on the back side. So we made a provision that you could use some tape or you basically just scuff the inside of that splitter if it's irregular. It doesn't mean it's gonna happen on each one. Right. Uh, and so, that's because they're not hand, they're kind of handmade, they're like laminated in a sense, so that backside is going to be rough, right? The finish? Well, just the nature of an auto clave carbon part. They're putting their pre-preg inside it. It's manually laid. They have their schedule, which there's overlap areas. So that's where you get the little bumps. Mm -hmm. But uh, our winglets are identical to the stock one, or the OEM one, I should say. So, so that made the interchangeability between the two. That's why when you notice it's the same part number, we're just, obviously, we mentioned both on the website. Yeah. But we're only doing that so you, you select the product that you have on your car. Uh, that being said, you have to be careful if you have uh, another type of 5VM splitter. Yeah. Uh, what we notice a lot is the winglets of all the other aftermarket splitters are different. So we'll notice ours has a little bevel, just like the OEM one. Yeah. But all the other aftermarket ones are really flat. And there's a reason they probably did that. It's probably tooling an angle or manufacturing simplicity. So today, paying attention to the side winglet will tell you if our under tray is going to work. Mm -hmm. And already, I think we've only been selling this one week and I've had a lot of calls about different types of splitters. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not testing every single aftermarket splitter out there, but so far we're two for two. We've seen customers test on um, some replicas and a winglet was the giveaway. So if you send us a picture of your splitter, we could tell you right away. You could tell too. I mean, if the winglet on your 5 VM looks flat and boxy, 
uh, the undertrace, so I'm going to work on that. And that's really a, a sign that it's a replica shaped. They basically adapted it and, and usually it's the tooling angle so that they could make the part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the buckets. I mean, to me, that's pretty interesting. That was, seems pretty unique. It's also something that was probably the first sort of time we've introduced like a, a mounting system, a bracket system. I mean, where did, where did that idea come from and where, did you have any challenges when you were actually designing it? It's actually an evolution. Um, we've all seen the OEM setup on the C7, right? They have an under tray on the, on the carbon splitter. We then made a C7 ZR1 under tray. And that was really a, a, our, our test product to get to where we are today. So on a C7 ZR1, we made buckets, but we glued the buckets to the splitter. So every splitter got those buckets and it added strength to it. But for a C8, it was a little different. We were able to design that splitter to work without any buckets. That's what I mean. It's like we were designing a convertible and then ran a coupe. So that splitter is strong enough to stand on its own. And now we were able to make buckets. Uh, the only flaw there was the multi-piece design. So tooling wise, it was pretty intense. Yeah. So, so now we have one, two, three, four major tools to make this system. But from an assembly standpoint, it made us do something where you didn't have to modify the car. You didn't have to drill extra holes onto the car. And we were just adding strength and performance to it. And that's where the buckets came about. And that's where you see all the features with the, the U-nuts and all that. And again, it might be a bit of an overkill, but it's safety. And again, we're trying to make sure that we could pass that 200 miles an hour test. Yeah, they're impressive units. I mean, just seeing the person employing out of the box, you're like, hey, this is a serious setup. I'm gonna mount to my car and hook up. Um, I was wondering too, like, I never think I asked you this, but were there different versions of how you were going to mount the under tray or were you pretty set? Like, um, you're going to do a bucket system and you already had sort of a, an envision of what those buckets were going to look like? I mean, if I answer it generally, it's 20 years of versions. I mean, uh, over the years we've tested aluminum, like flat sheet stocks of aluminum where we've designed splitters to keep that flat edge. So there's a recipe to designing that under tray. We want to keep it as parallel to the ground. So that opened up a lot of process and uh, we tried different plastics and different things but it's uh i guess it's an evolution to where we got mm -hmm. i think the current c8 setup is probably the best that bucket system with the complete panel and the fasteners we're using and the lip to around the edge it's something that we don't talk a lot of, we don't talk about a lot yeah. but having that little wrap around gives it strength and it lets us um, make sure that we can take all the scrapes if anyone's watched the uh, install video that you did which is really good you, you actually mentioned how the lip kind of goes a bit around the splitters to kind of help you to prevent from like catching. Mm -hmm. Maybe just sort of like explain that a bit too as well. Like, Well, thinking uh, it's like sort of tripping. We, we've all been caught where we need to go up a ramp like at the airport or something like that. It's a really steep incline and um, things happen so fast. You don't even have time to activate the camera to judge. You, you just go, you have to get out of the way mm -hmm. and you're scraping. And basically when you're scraping, you're forcing that under panel. And uh, if that transition is not right, uh, we do more damage. And that's what we've seen on the C7 OEM splitter, where they had the splitter and then they had a bunch of brackets glued on and we had that intersection. And that was one of the biggest things that we were trying to fix on the C7 was that turbulence. And it's not only air turbulence, it's scraping. And uh, that creates a tear point. So basically that's what gets caught. And the worst thing you could do in that situation is scrape and then back up. Mm -hmm. And that's our instinct. When we get caught and we scrape, yeah. we, we want to backtrack and sort of save the car but in reality, we're making things worse. We now tripped over usually concrete or asphalt with all little rocks and a very abrasive surface. If we back up, you're gonna tear it apart. And if you have a carbon splitter, that's a given. Uh, we're fortunate with our PC, our material selection was done that, that it would take that. Yeah. So we actually sand it away without tearing it. So it's the prone to tear, which is not a, not a, a quantified property, but it's something that we test quite often. And that's how we came to that material. Yeah. And that's why we're so happy with the, the current design with the wraparound and all that. Yeah. And then also on top of having that wraparound, we introduced um, for the first time those uh, straight guards we can yep. put underneath. There's Little like a skid plates. series of skid plates that you can install onto. We say it's optional, but I think for the most part, we're going to put that. I would always put it on. Yeah. Uh, the skid plates basically came during testing. Uh, originally, the splitter did not have any uh, skid plates. Again, we were focusing on the performance side of it. We didn't want to create any turbulence. Then we started making small high points into the splitter design, which I thought was really great. We were going from like a three millimeter to a six millimeter material. And that worked really great when we were trying it out in the field. We were wearing these high points out. So basically it was like a rake. Those were the high points that would contact, mm -hmm. but 99% of the surface area was still flat. So it was a really nice balance. 
And as we were doing this and scrapping parts as we were testing, like, well, why don't we just make this modular and give the customer the possibility to service the part down, you know, down the line. And if three years from now, he's worn out those kids, you could replace them. And yeah. that's why we're actually throwing two in because we know that two are probably going to wear out. But if you want to change them all in three years or two years, you just call us and we'll set up an order for those uh, skid plate maintenance. Yeah, and it's as easy as just drilling out the rivets, redoing it basically. I mean, at that point, uh, you could even remove the under tray off the car, clean it up, uh, drill everything out, reassemble it so you don't have to work upside down and put it back together so that you don't get the shavings and all that stuff um, stuck in there. Yeah, let's talk a bit now about the manufacturing side of it. I mean, this is, when you pull it out of the box, it's it's a serious unit. I mean, it ships in the same box we ship our splitters, which is like 76 by six by 28. It's just a, a massive, massive unit. What are, we're obviously doing a crazy amount of injection for this part just because of the, the sheer surface area. Were there any manufacturing challenges with this? There was manufacturing challenges and even design. I mean, at, at one point we were considering a three piece design and then a two piece design. And really at that point, we were trying to make it in a way cost effective. Uh, we've seen a lot of different scrape protective systems that are multi-piece. That's really great from a manufacturing standpoint because you're not scrapping material. It's a smaller box to ship. But at the end of the day, we said, you know what? We want to have the best possible product to make the product a single piece and as large as possible, or at least cover the area we needed to. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to be held back. So again, we did the best we could from a design standpoint. We did um, we did quite a bit of analysis too. So, so we know that we're almost tripling the downforce that splitter could generate. So we're really maximizing that shape. But now we're falling into what you're saying, the manufacturing challenge. Because we got greedy in design, the manufacturing team really struggled to inject it. And I'd say we probably lost 14 months to bring this product to market simply because we couldn't make the product. Right. And uh, a lot of things were done to accommodate it. The material selection was something we didn't want to compromise. We did make a first batch in a, I guess, softer plastic just to test the geometry. But mechanically, it just wasn't scrape friendly. It wasn't rigid enough. And we didn't want to compromise that. We we're really stuck on the material, but we just couldn't inject it. Our resin that we use is so hard and rigid that you need to fill that void. And because the panel is so large and so thin in a way, the resin didn't want to travel through it. So we had to come up with a lot of different clever ways to fill it. And uh, basically at the end, we came out with some design changes to the part. So we basically made uh, flow channels in it. Uh, we tested external channels, internal, and we actually built it to the park now. So it's actually the first time we did something like that, but it worked. Yeah. And uh, even playing with the thickness, we were able to increase the thickness, I think by 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeter, which helped us fill it. But we're talking about a press that's over 2000 tons in pressure. Yeah. And uh, we still couldn't fill it and keep it clamped in order to get to the end. So, so we're limiting on time uh, on this resin that we're using. So we, we need to fill something at a particular time, otherwise it starts kicking. And because of the surface areas, that, that was the challenge. Well, I mean, what does the, the tool look like of this, uh, of this part? Like how big is it? Like, what, what kind of, like give us some dimensions. It looks like a desk. I mean, uh, the size of this tool um, is 100 inches by 48 inches by 12 inches. It, it's metal, it's massive, it weighs close to 5,000 pounds. It's mounted in a 2,000 ton press. Mm -hmm. um, and again, filling it was always a challenge. So uh, that was quite something. Are there any like uh, sort of like fun, fun maybe facts that we don't really know about that, that happened during the development, manufacturing, and entire process of uh, releasing this product that you could think of? Well, our breakthrough was really adding our, uh, what we call the river. So if you look at the part, you'll see there's like a one inch band in the, the back portion of it. Mm -hmm. It actually intersects the injection point, which you could tell we're not hiding that. The strength, again, was the most important thing. So this panel could have knit lines, could have marks on it. But again, we'd rather have a cosmetic blem on a part, but have the strongest possible material. So that's something that you basically have to choose what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. We could have made this part flawless and perfectly black, but it wouldn't have the same mechanicals. And this is true to a lot of our components. We'll maybe sacrifice something that's a B surface, but we know that we're giving you durability. And the durability and performance is out outdoes the cosmetic visual of a part that's under a car or hidden in a wheel well. Right. You mentioned um, <clears throat> the, the manufacturing challenges maybe set you back at probably about 14 months. But in terms of complete development, what was the that's sort of the timeline for this product from uh, conception to release? Close to three years. Uh, the, the under tray for the C8 was born the day the C8 was introduced. So the second that car came out, 
uh, the idea was always to make the best aero component and the other tree was always part of that. Mm -hmm. So we ended up splitting it and then coming out with our splitter line, the one five and seven VM, mm -hmm. but the under tree was always trailing it. So we always knew that was coming. We didn't feel bad about it because we always knew it was modular. So, so we could sell splitters to any customer and anybody, and anybody that asked about an under tree, we would tell them it's coming, we're developing it and it's modular. So, so it's really great. You could buy a splitter today with confidence. And if you're a track goer, well, come back in a year or today mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be able to sell you that splitter without losing the splitter you had. So that was uh, really the fun part, knowing that somebody wasn't buying something that they may regret. And that's always the big thing in a C7 line. The customer is at that crossroad from the get go. He needs to make the decision on the spot. Am I going for the under trade version or not? And uh, basically this is working out so well, we'll probably bring it to the C7 line. Yeah, I think that's probably my favorite thing about this product too. I was kind of mentioning in the beginning is it, it's like there's like a marriage between now that there's, before there was like a, a clear separation between a track goer and then someone who was just not really interested in going to the track. So the under tray kind of divided that clientele. Whereas now mm -hmm. with the C8 under tray, we're, we're sort of fusing these two people together where it's saying, if you want to be that track guy, this is a great product for you because it's still highly performing. You're going to get protection out of it. But also for the guy who's maybe not, who's taking out his Corvette maybe every every weekend or something, it's still like an excellent product and should be something they should consider adding because you're still kind of protecting your car. You're getting those mm -hmm. both those both worlds out of it. So there's a more compromise. I think that's the part I'm the most proud about. Uh, we're not asking the customer to make a decision and compromise something on the C7. He had to choose between performance, which was the under tree version, but then he had to live with a white uh, fiberglass part if you were to nick it, scrape it, or potentially crack it. And then you could have gone with the driver's friendly one, which was made out of piece of composite, which is still a great product, but he didn't have the under tray. Yeah. So he always had a, a pro and a con and the price and the insulation. Now we've eliminated all that. You basically, you buy as you go or as you need, and uh, you could do the splitter, you could do the under tray after the fact, or do it all at once if you want, but everything is modular, serviceable, and it's all of the right material. It's all the, the, the best possible material that's spray friendly and rigid. Yeah. And that's the PC. Yeah. I mean, you often talk to me about, um, you know, sort of advising guys on balancing their car in terms of performance. And I think it was probably more important too now if, if someone adds an under trade to sort of maybe add something mm -hmm. in the back to sort of balance out that aerodynamic. Can you sort of talk Absolutely. a little bit about that as well and how people can go about balancing out their car? Well, look, the, the the roadmap of our product line was basically done from the get-go. So, so the first two weeks of the car's released, we basically start studying the car and, and setting out the parts that will be released over time. And uh, basically that now it's starting to come together as we start probably talking about the C9 next week. Mm -hmm. But basically we have the under tray system with the splitter and obviously back spoiler. So ideally the car that has this has at least a Z51 package normally, or they've added the Z51 spoiler. And then to that, you have the wickers. So basically the wickers and the under tray were really uh, connected to each other. Uh, same thing with like the diffuser. But uh, I'd say the wickers was probably the biggest uh, element to balance this. And again, it's not detrimental. You could still mix and match. It's how aggressive you want to go. Yeah. And all these numbers really come into effect at high speed. Right. So if you're not going to be hitting the high triple digit numbers, uh, it's not really going to affect you. I mean, you're doing it for other reasons. But it's nice to know that everything was validated. And now uh, we've hired, um, we've hired a, an XF1 engineer that helps us with all the aerodynamics of the car. And we're able to look at different designs and basically decide this works and this doesn't. And it's all experience that we gain as, as we develop and go through this. And when you're developing and we're running these products through programs of like CFD analysis, hmm. I mean, what's sort of that process? How do you, how do you decide this, this product's good enough or not good enough? And we do a lot of comparative testing on the screen. So, so, um, Unfortunately, we don't have access to a wind tunnel, which is a whole different ball game. Uh, we basically do everything on CFD, so the, we had to create a benchmark. Step one was really to generate our stock setup. So, so we started with the C51 car and basically started modifying from there. And um, we're not gonna hide it, the 5VM came right out of the GM design team, but we were still able to tweak it and, and perfect it mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. And basically that, that's where we went to the comparative and balance the car and we get the weights on each wheel at different speeds. Mm -hmm. And basically that, that's all we're doing. We're basically uh, creating different setups, different ideas and, and validate them. And it's easy for us to tell if this one's better than the other. You mentioned a bit about like our product roadmap, but before I sort of go there, is there anything you want to maybe mention about the under tray that we probably didn't really talk about yet? Or some maybe a key feature, some things you should mm -hmm. consider? 
I don't have an answer to that. That's all right. You covered it all. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty, it was interesting. I mean, honestly, I kind of learned some things too, just uh, by asking, which is kind of cool. Um, specifically about like the the river channel. Like I never really knew that that was like an issue or, or a thing that we had come up with, which is pretty interesting. I mean, there was a point that this product was not going to make it to production. And um, we did not want to use the, the, the TO and the ABS in it. And uh, it, it actually was probably proper. I mean, it was a plastic that was easy to use. And uh, some of the panels, the OEM panels are made of that material. And that's why I'm, our plastic team was like, well, if they do it, why can't we? Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is they're using egg crates and they're mating all these panels to the car 100%. Okay. We were generating a new surface that's like two inches away from the car. It's like a triangle void that we're filling to make it flat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just didn't want that plastic. If we had to do that, we would have needed more reinforcements, more weights, and then, then that's somewhere we didn't want to go. Yeah. And uh, we basically, uh, it, it paid to basically push further and made the PC work. So, so we know that we're being consistent and using the best material everywhere we can. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So we're talking about roadmap a bit, or you mentioned it. I mean, 2023, we've already released our under tray. We've released our diffuser. Uh, I think we may have released a C7 product that's probably escaping me right now, but what are some other products that are coming out that you want to come out? Or is there anything you could tell us maybe that... Uh, so what's around the corner? Yeah. Well, basically, we're, we're always listening to our clientele. Uh, we have a roadmap, but we also want what people want mm -hmm. or what they want to see. What the needs uh, are. Uh, yeah, 2022 brought us to Z06. So obviously, that's opening up a whole new market. We, we have guys that basically want to get a Z06 look, but don't necessarily need the extra power and all that extra hardware that comes with it. The Stingray car is a perfect car as a daily driver and a well-balanced car. The CO6 is, is a race car. That's what that is. I mean, yeah. I want one and who doesn't want one? But if we're talking about the right tool for the job, if you're going to shows, you're going to work and you're going on weekend cruises and you go to the track once a month, the Stingray is the perfect car. So why don't we just take this to the next level and help it? And that's what we do with all aero components. But now we're talking about the Z06 and basically our Sting Z06 side rocker came out and there's a few other items that are going to follow that naturally. Cool. We pretty much covered everything, I think, in the uh, the under tray. I mean, if anyone has any questions, they can uh, obviously comment below. We'll try and answer. You can shoot us emails. I really enjoyed your Dev Talk. I think it's uh, it's creating a lot a lot of fun content that uh, sometimes we keep internally. Cause yeah. It's our experience and it's what we go through, but it's fun to share it with our customers. I mean, some of them call and ask questions, and but we don't realize that this is uh, great information to share. And now you understand a little bit more what we go through. Yeah. And uh, why sometimes it takes longer to bring a product to market. And uh, basically now we're sort of catching up and our tooling department's back up and running where it was pre-pandemic, I guess. Yeah. So there's a lot more that's going to get released in 23 and 24. Awesome. Looking forward to it. And uh, if you want to see any specific products on the Dev Talk, let us know. We'll try to uh, get Joseph back in the car and uh, tell us all his secrets. Cool. Thanks for watching. Thanks.